Welcome, everyone. Hey, do you remember the gentleman who had problem with a 300 h and Magnum in his Model 70 Winchester? This is the guy. <laughs> Steve is back with an update. What is happening with your rifle? Did you get it fixed? No. <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> No, Ron, it's been it's been an interesting process, though. I, <clears throat> as you know, that um, you know the all the details that we went into before with not being able to chamber around and or ream the chamber out, and then couldn't extract the shell. Well, just a few days ago, we finally got back in line with the gunsmith. You know, it's a you have to wait your turn type thing. And he was getting he had the gun on his lathe, and he was going to take off. Um, some of the some of the barrel on the on the receiver end in order to to try and circumvent some of these issues that are happening inside the barrel. So he's going to cut the breech off, yep. shorten it, rechamber it a little bit longer yes. to try to get rid of whatever <clears throat> yep. was holding yep. things up. Yes. Okay, that yes. makes sense. And as he was getting ready to do that, he noticed that the inside of the the breech didn't look quite right, and so he got his camera equipment out, magnification out, and. Oddly enough, he found a a sleeve that had been had been installed inside there. A sleeve. A sleeve. So someone at some point had tried to the barrel was shot pretty badly. And so someone had tried to sleeve it in order to circumvent that portion of the that portion of the barrel that Where was did damaged. they where did they put this sleeve? In the barrel or in the yeah. chamber? <clears throat> it's actually in the it's in the yeah. chamber moving forward. And so so to picture it, where it stops is right where the uh, the neck of the cartridge intersects the, the the top end of the slope of the shoulder. The shoulder, okay. So what we thought was where the the case was actually um, separating at that point, which is what it exactly what it looked like. It looked like a fracture around there that we talked about in the last time we spoke. Um, it's actually hanging up, and so as the brass as as the as the round is fired and the brass expands, it expanded into the edge of that sleeve, and it's just hmm. microscopic. Hmm. It's tiny, tiny, it's tiny, tiny. But it's it enough up. that when you go to extract the bolt, you know, extract the case with the bolt, it would hang up on that on that lip. Could you see this insert the sleeve in the chamber at the rear of the chamber? No, it's 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 forward. So it's not a, a complete chamber no, no. sleeve. It's just a throat sleeve. Yeah, that's what it looks like. <clears throat> Never heard and, of such a well, thing. Well, I I haven't actually been able to see it physically. I'm just what I'm relating to you is what the gunsmith told me mm -hmm. over the phone, and he said that explained why you couldn't chamber the round, because that's that sleeve was sticking back far enough into the chamber that it was actually it was actually stopping. Stopping the 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 case from being able to go and it was effectively shortening your headspace exactly. By the shoulder a, would slam up against yeah, this thing. One hundred twenty five thousandths worth, which is an eighth of an inch. And so that explain that that explains why a, a rifle that had been shot so much and had been uh, had shown so much exposure to heat and to powder and and you know expansion mm -hmm. contraction and everything why you couldn't chamber around is because that, that was mechanically. And, and here's the issue is, is that they started the project and didn't finish it. So all of that was put in there. And then somebody decided this probably isn't going to work and they stopped. And then they found you. <laughs> they found me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Joe Schmo right here. <laughs> but but as we said before, folks, he bought this rifle expecting to have to do some work on it. I did. Steve enjoys it. It's a project. He wants to refinish the stock. He wants to do a few yeah. things, but he probably didn't want to do this much. Yeah, it's really important. But, you know, for me, they're they're not collector pieces. Um, I look at them with regard to their usability factor. Mm -hmm. And um, as we discussed before, you know, I have a, a pretty long list of of items that I go through and checking off the criteria that it, that meets my approval and and willingness to spend the money to buy the gun, knowing that I'm going to get to do these things to help the gun. Yeah, you know, put but it back. You, to, but you didn't expect anything like this. No, no, I mean, no, no. Who's no, ever no, heard no. of leaving <clears throat> no, no. the throat? I've never heard of such a thing. It got me, and the gunsmith. The gunsmith actually had to had to call. And he, he finally found somebody somewhere that walked him through the process and how they used to do it. So they actually 
didn't Used know to. about it. Yeah. And yeah. obviously someone had done it before because they did it this time. Yeah. This couldn't but, be one off. But the general the, the general feeling is that whoever started the project didn't know how to finish it. Really? Yeah. And mm -hmm. that, that they just, they finally gave up. But the, the seller told you that he had hunted with that yes. rifle a few years before. Yes. So it was working for him. Why wasn't it suddenly not working for you? <clears throat> well, as I discussed last time, I don't think it's the same gun. I think I think he had his his rifles mixed up. He had three 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 hundred H and H's, and I think hmm. he's an older guy. And and quite honestly, I, I think he's just confused. Hmm. I mean, it's not it's nothing personal. It's just yeah. And he did offer to take it back. If it well, was he he something. offered what he offered to do was to send me a replacement barrel. Uh huh. Uh, and I thought, well, whoa, here we go. This will work. Yeah. Except it's chambered in 300 Weatherby. Uh, yeah. That's, <laughs> That's not going to work. That's, That's not what I want. But anyway, so we're still we're still trying to figure out what to do. Um, and, and I, I wish I had more information for you, Ron, but that's, that's what I know right now. Well, it's an update. I mean, we still want you to, to get the whole thing worked out and I want you to come back and we want to shoot it on the range right. and everything else. But at this juncture though, do you think you should just eat it and buy a new barrel or what? Well, the first step is, is to, to, to get an absolute answer from the gunsmith on what can be done and what can't be done. You That's, think it still may be salvageable? He thinks, he thinks, he, and the, 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 to the gunsmith's credit, he's not charged me for this. Hmm. That's nice. He's, he's into it so much that, you know, from a, uh, 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 you know, just experimental aspect. He just thinking, wants learning, to figure he, this he, thing he, out. He, huh? He's determined he's going to figure it out. Yeah. So it's taking longer than it should have. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that um, I'm willing, I can't use the gun now this season anyway. So at this point, I, you know, you know, too late my, for this yeah, it's season. too late. It's too late for this season. So anyway, I think, I think what we're going to do is step one is to figure out what can or cannot be done. Mm -hmm. And I told him, I said, well, I'm going to, I'm going to hang up and I'm going to call the guy I bought the gun from and just tell him what's happening. He said, don't call him yet. He said, you just wait until I have a hundred percent definitive information on what we can and cannot do, and then you decide what you're going to do. Ah, okay. And I think at this point, my first step would be to see if the guy will just take the gun back and give me a refund. Mm -hmm. That would be the first step. Okay. Uh, there's some other issues we talked about, the stock, some of the, you know, the shortness yeah. of the stock, some of the other things have just bugged the crud out of me. But at, at this point, I, I think we're both determined to um, have a real answer and not just shut down. So you know, at least is, you've got the yeah, satisfaction yeah. of having figured out this puzzle. Yeah, right? yeah. and that's yeah, the whole thing. We could never about. figure out why, if he hunted with it, why you couldn't chamber around. Yeah. And so at this point, um, and that gunsmith kept saying to me, he said, well, you, you, wanted, you just want to shoot it, right? I said, yeah, I want to shoot it. He said, well, I shot it, and it shoots a one-inch group with just random loads. Yeah. He said, so it's, a, it's, gonna, it, it's going to shoot. The issue is, is can we make it safe to shoot or not? Right. Can it function accurately? Right, yeah, right. Right. Because because basically right now, if we left it like it is right now and we were able to figure out a way to extract the cases, the, the brass is damaged to the point where you can't reload it and reuse it. Okay. So I don't, I'm not going there. I, that's, that to me is, is that's counterproductive. Yeah, yeah. And I don't want to do that. But that's, that's the update. It's, okay. it's, it's interesting stuff. It's frustrating as all get out. It's sure. one of those life lessons of, Coulda, woulda, shoulda. Yeah, yeah. But it is what it is. Yeah, and it's a hobby. It is. It's, it's fun. all educational. Yeah. It's kind yeah. of fun to learn that stuff. And others can learn from your I hope so. I hope so. You know, I'm willing to stand up and say, hey, I screwed up. You know, yeah. you guys, <laughs> here I am. Learn from this so you yeah, don't, yeah, you know, yeah. you don't, don't want do to Don't do like say, Steve. Yeah, don't do like what don't I do. Don't be like Steve. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> now, one, one thing before we finish this, this part of it, before we get into the deer hunt and the pheasant hunt, is... uh the gunsmiths, you can't find more gunsmiths because you keep saying the guy's so busy, he can't get to it. He can't right. get to it. It goes weeks after week. Well, I've on, I'm on my, <clears throat> since we've lived in, 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 in Utah, I'm on my uh, fourth gunsmith. What happened to the other? Uh, the first one got Lou Gehrig's disease and, uh, and then he died during with COVID. Um, and then another one was an older guy that was even older than that. Mm -hmm. that was just sick all the time. Mm -hmm. And he just, he would never, he could not get anything done because he was constantly going to the hospital doing all that kind of stuff. And then uh, the one that I have right now is extremely good. I mean, he is, he is just phenomenally good. He just has more work than he can handle. Mm. 
Mm. And so his mode of operation is, is to try to take care of immediate needs of hunters who have tags or going hunting oh, sure. and then postpone everything else. Yeah, that's nice. Which, that's nice. I, you know, if I were in that situation, I'd be very appreciative. It's just when I'm sitting there going like, yeah. what's wrong? What's wrong? Let's go. Let's go. Let's yeah, go. Let's yeah, go. Yeah. Let's go. It's nothing's yeah. happening. And then the other one is, uh, the other one that I found is 45 minutes away. Now there's an, uh, there's another, um, like Sportsman's Warehouse, for example, have their own gunsmithing department mm -hmm. um, in Salt Lake. Uh, but the last time I checked, they were nine to 12 months out. Oh, my goodness. So, so the, the upshot here, and the reason I asked you this, because, of course, we've talked a little bit about this before and often, is why aren't there more gunsmiths? It's not like there's plenty of work out there. If these people are overloaded, they're older guys, they're dying off. Our generation, it seems to be like we're the, the last of the of that 20th century yeah. hunters, gun nuts, and kids just aren't getting into it now. And it seems like there's job opportunities here you, you would think so yeah you would in, think so but it's probably wrong to a large extent uh, the same reason why in like the construction trades there are no young people involved i mean really? the, yeah the, the the average construction worker age of like of electricians in utah is in the 50s mm-hmm 50 years old, you know, and, and same with plumbers. Yeah, and same thing. It's else. just, it's, it's an aging demographic that is not, you know, that, that at the educational level, junior high and high school, where we had uh wood shop, auto mechanics and all that kind of stuff. The focus is completely off onto other things because nobody thinks that that's a worthy profession. Well, it's because we need more masters in Russian literature. And, and that, well, that's true. The yeah, country I is hard thought, up on those. I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> so, that's good. Well, I, I think it'll come around. I mean, this is that, um, who's the, um, Mike, Mike, the, uh, dirty jobs guy, Mike Rowe. Don't know. <laughs> Yeah, he had the TV shows about dirty jobs where he went out and he said, hey, you ever oh. consider who takes care of your sewage? You know, people have jobs doing this stuff. It's right. a dirty job, but somebody has to do it. And he would show some appreciation and respect for people we depend on for jobs nobody wants. Right. And I think what has happened is that everybody's decided, you know, this is the modern age. You push a button and the computer does everything for you. So right. why should I have to get my hands dirty? And he is saying, we need more kids to go into the trades. Because they're great, great jobs that pay well that nobody's doing. And all of us who decided to get our advanced degrees in some field for which there are no jobs, <laughs> where right. you sit by a desk and use your brain, we still need our plumbing done. We still need our electric work done and all the things that make the world go round. So we, we need these people just the way we need gunsmiths. True. So get to it, man. Take some classes. <laughs> You're young yet. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. We, I think, have hashed the gunsmithing trade for a bit. Now we're going to switch to what you wanted that 300 H, H4, which is a deer hunt yes. in Kansas. Yes. But before we go to Kansas and shoot some big deer, we've got to tell folks about what we did this morning. <laughs> Steve came up to the ranch and hoping to get pheasants. He's been training a new lab. How old is Echo now? It's 18 months. 18 month old. Lab. He's done a grand job. He goes out with Echo every morning to yep. train. Seven days a week. <laughs> she is really good. And he's just been wanting to get her into birds. So of course, being a great guy that he is, I invited him up. And the first time he came up, he didn't get any shots. And the second time you came up, did you get some shots and didn't I get did. them? I missed. Missed? <clears throat> missed. That's but why it, the new nickname, Rusty. <laughs> <laughs> they called him R Rusty after that. Because it had, what, been 10 years or more since you'd hunted birds? Uh, Mid-80s. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, no wonder yeah. you missed. At any rate, he's practicing. He's got a nice Satori over under 20 gauge. And we went out. And you can imagine what, what it's like on poor Ron here. I invite my friend up to get some pheasants and I try to put him in the perfect spot. There's just the two of us or there are two dogs. And I say, boy, Steve, I think they usually are on that side of the bushes. You should go over there. And they get up in front of me every time, practically. You know, and I have to admit it was, um, and I've already shared this with Ron, but being able to stand back and watch it happen, watch his, watch Covey uh, point and then the birds flush watch the pheasant rise up out of the bushes and up into the sky and to watch Ron mount and swing and shoot and drop the birds. I mean, it was just like, it's just like you're watching something that it, you dream about, you know, because it's, it's so much fun to watch and it just, it just lights you up. 
when you see it happen. And it, and it, it truly is. The cackle of the rooster and the sun off the bird and the colors, and then to see the dogs go out and retrieve the birds, it's just, it's just, it's an adventure that you can't, you can't describe to somebody unless they do it because it's just so much fun. Yeah. You know, and I have been doing this since I was 13 years old. Mm -hmm. And today that double I got behind the barn was as special as any I've ever done before. And it is hard to articulate and unless you're there and you feel it as well as see it. But I told Steve, Steve, we're going to walk up this little strip of trees that's coming down this little draw, this little creek. You can walk on the flat side here where it's not steep and slopey and rocky because it's pretty nasty on this other side. And they usually get up right down the, the strip. They're usually right in the bottom. So that we'll be both in range on them. So you go to that side. I'll go to this side. Let's go. He goes over with Echo. I'm on my side. I think Covey was actually on your side at that point. Yeah, she was She was in between us. But yeah. she, she was more on my side than on your side. And, and I took about four steps up the rise right behind my wife's chicken barn. And a rooster gets up. And I can remember in slow motion <laughs> thinking, that's a pheasant. That's a rooster pheasant. I can shoot that pheasant. <laughs> and, and Steve can't because it's the bushes are in the way. He's on the other side. I guess I'll just have to shoot it. And I, in just one motion, I raised that gun and bang, it went. And everything felt like it should work. And that pheasant it boom, came down. It, it, yeah. Covey came over for the retrieve. But as soon as I shot, I think it was right when I shot. Maybe it was when Covey ran through there. Well, it's, Covey but, came, when Covey crossed the ditch. The second bird flush. A second bird flush is within ten yards of the first yeah, one or less. Yeah, and it was it was gorgeous. I mean, it was just it was one of those you see the bird take off and the tail feathers come up out of the grass, <laughs> and it swings out in front of Ron, and you see Ron pick up, and it's just again, and, unless you've actually done it and you've watched it, you can't appreciate the beauty of it. I mean, yeah. it really is. It's it was an art form. And I felt it. I don't know why. Maybe it's my good friend Steve's with me and my dogs and everything <laughs> in a beautiful day. It's just an unbelievably beautiful November day. We haven't even had any snow yet. It's a crazy year, but we're enjoying the heck out of it. But to get two doubles within 20 yards of my wife's chicken barn, <laughs> it was pretty special. And the backdrop. I mean, I mean again, I can, I can see slow motion, the whole thing, the blue sky, the saddle and the hill up above. You know, the slope going up, the tree, the the grass, the dogs, hmm. Ron. I mean, I can, I can, I have this mental image of all of it, but Ron, that's what makes it worth getting out of bed in the morning. Yeah. That's what makes it fun. That's what makes it when things don't go right, when you're rusty. You remember that, the, old, <laughs> the time they did go right, huh? Yeah. You remember those things because they're, they're significant events. Yeah. And, and that's what memories are made of. Uh, uh, significant events like that. And they're good memories. Yeah. They're good, sure. healthy, healthy memories. Yeah. Now we've got some pheasants to eat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's just the fun with the pheasant hunting. Now we can look forward to the deer hunt. So I hunt Kansas deer almost every year. And Steve was pretty interested in when he saw some of my antlers and some of my mounts. Where'd you get these big bucks in all oh, Kansas? You know, well, everybody knows about Kansas, pretty good hunting state for big whitetails. Yeah. And I thought, boy, I'd like to get Steve into a, a whitetail like that. Now I can't promise you anything, Steve, but my buddy and I, he's got a couple of landowners who let us hunt. And then there are a few public areas. Kansas is not famous for a lot of public land, but there's some, and there's a lot of little walking areas on private ground, but the state leases it under a walk-in program where the landowner gets a little bit of money to let hunters come in. A lot of competition on there, but you never know when you're going to stumble onto a big deer. We've seen plenty of them when we're pheasant hunting. And Steve said, yeah, I'd like to try it. Well, I said, you better start applying because your chances of drawing a tag, I would imagine, is pretty slim. I was uh, a resident of Kansas and I had a lifetime license there, so I still get to go and buy a, a tag like a regular Kansan does. So I figured, well, and maybe Steve can come along as I deer hunt because he won't draw a tag and he can hunt pheasants or quail or something. Sure. He draws a tag. <laughs> First time out of the gate. <laughs> so yeah. he's probably used all his luck up already. I don't know. <laughs> well, either way. But you were going to use that 300 H&H, &H, right? I was. I, I really kind of um, over time evolved into the idea of taking a classic rifle like that and using it the way that it was intended to be used. Mm -hmm. um, it's not going to work out this time, but. So what are you going to use? Uh, it's a Browning A-Bolt. Uh, it's a 300 WSM that I've had since mid-80s, probably. Mm -hmm. 
That's a great gun. I've shot, um, I don't know, a, a lot. A lot with it, it huh? Yeah. Confident. Well, that's important to have some confidence in it. And and you feel pretty confident for a three to 400 yard reach if you need to? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Because that happens fairly often there. Not too often that I've had to shoot any of my Kansas deer further than three, 350. I really honestly can't say that I can remember even a 400 yarder. But I certainly had opportunities, but I've always been able to get closer. And an odd thing, and I've told you this before, but I want to let folks know, in those big, flat, open Kansas fields, I can usually stalk a deer out in the open as long as I watch it as I'm moving and I just head to it. And as when his head comes up, I stop. They don't notice me. Right out in the open. That's interesting. No brush or anything. Sometimes there might be grass halfway high on me or something like that. But I don't have to get down and crawl. I'm just walking. It's crazy. But I've noticed that over the years, those deer are, of course, keyed into any danger right there. You know, they've got their, their initial danger zone, like where a coyote could be there or a bobcat or something. They're really alert, as the bow hunters can tell you. Man, they are paying attention to that noise right close. Right. But you get to 100 yards and it's like, yeah, maybe. Get to 200 yards and a lot less chance that they're going to freak out. They might notice, you know, or if they smell you, they'll generally get pretty alarmed and maybe move. Right. But I have even found out that at 300 yards, they can smell me and go, eh, I'm not so sure about this. And they move off. At 400 yards, eh, you can have the wind blowing right toward them and they just ignore Seriously. me. Seriously. Seriously. This happened time and time again. I can't say it happens every time. There's probably been plenty of them that I spooked before I even knew they were there. But when I've been hunting them and noticing that kind of thing, over the years, I gradually figured out, gosh, I screwed up. That deer should be running because I'm right upwind of it. And it's kind of looking around and hmm, acting a little nervous. And it goes back to feeding. And then if there's no scent going to them and it's just you visually, they're not looking at 400 yards because there's no coyote or any other natural predator that's going to bother them from that distance. Mm -hmm. So until you get inside of 300 and most of the time, even 200, and if I'm not moving toward them and I see them coming and by golly, that deer's coming in my direction, I'm just going to stand here or sit here and wait for him. Usually I'm sitting by then or I will sit as he's coming and get ready to shoot. And I just wait until he comes closer and closer and closer. And I have had them pass me. And I'm talking bucks almost this big, big old bucks that should know better. Pass me at bow range. And I didn't wow. shoot them and they just kept going right on by me. Oh my. Now, of course, we're going to get there to hunt. <laughs> there are going to be tails, nothing but white tails all the time. Yeah. Well, the only white tail hunting that I've actually done, um, I've hunted in uh, Kentucky and Tennessee and Iowa. But unfortunately, that was all basically tree stand hunting mm -hmm. and um, not my cup of tea. Um, but, uh, you know, those deer are a completely different kind of deer I think you're intellectually right. than, than your prairie deer um, because they're so, everything is, there are so many people. And they're close. They're very close, yeah. very close. And they're, they're like, they're, I mean, I had a friend tell me that he saw a buck, um, you know, through his kitchen window and he and his brother went out to go shoot this buck out in the field and they couldn't find it. It was out, there's a little wood lot, less than an acre wood lot out mm -hmm. in the middle. Mm -hmm. And they, and there was fresh snow and they went around and around and around and no tracks coming out. So he knew the buck was in there. Mm -hmm. Well, it turned out the guy climbed it up inside there and was walking along on top of a fallen log. And here's this white tailed buck laying down underneath the log with his nose down like a fawn hiding. Wow. So guess how far his shot was? <laughs> 10 feet? <laughs> About two feet. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I mean, he literally just laid his, his <laughs> rifle down and shot it. Wow. But, but that's a different kind of a deer. I yes. mean, that, that is a, a yeah. deer that's acclimated towards uh, a lot more people and urbanization. And, and, you know, there's a whole lot more deer there too. I mean, yeah. there's just, yeah. I mean, there's just, there's unbelievable numbers of deer. Yeah. No, these Kansas bucks, we're going to be in rolly pastures. Some of them pretty big rolly hills. Right. Could be the flat stuff as well. Could be some crop fields. But it's, it's a mixture of pastures and the crop fields. And then down in the draws, the woody draws, and along some creeks and stuff, you're going to have trees and brush and things. So it's a nice mix. That's nice. But generally, we're able to glass and find deer pretty far. It's not the last year, but the second to last year I think I got there was, oh, I think we saw it at probably 800 yards or something, close to a half mile coming off of a feed field. 
down into a draw. And lots of grass and then the draw, we really could just see a few treetops sticking up above it. And as we're moving down a fence line to get closer to this deer and several doe that were with it, just one buck, there's the bobcat going across the open field out there. There's a coyote going across the field out there. Wow. All of this exciting stuff happens at once. It's wonderful. But we kept moving closer to that deer and then we lost track of it because it got down underneath into that draw. So it's like he could be in that draw. He could have gone up it. He could have gone down it. Like, let's just get over there and see what we can see. When we eased over to where we could start seeing down into the draw, there are antlers walking alongside of it. So he's, say the roll is like this. We are up on top and he's just down the slope mm -hmm. and all we can see are antler tips. Oh, he's right there. Walking along right there, yeah. So we fought, we paralleled him, like kind of half ready to go because as soon as he pops up and I can see more than antlers, maybe I'll get a shot, you know. And he's a little bit ahead of us so that he's not seeing us if he does happen to look that way. And he just keeps going like that until another draw met it. And he kind of disappeared. That's like, ah, oh, now what? Should we go closer? Or oh, oh, now he's coming up over the next little rise, going up the next draw. And I'm seeing the top of his back, but not quite enough to make a shot. And he goes down into another little side cut and never comes out. And I said to Tommy, I think he might have bedded in there because it's about that time of day and he should have popped out. We should have been able to see him. Well, what should we do? I said, if he's sleeping in there and as close as we are, I bet I could grunt him out of there. I think I'll try it. Let's just sit down. We were right on a fence line. We sat down by two posts and I went <coughs> about two or three times. And here he came. Just, <laughs> just on a string. Man, all puffed up and ready for action, man. Right. I could have shot him with a slingshot. Had a seven rem mag with a Acubond long range bullet all geared up to shooting far, you know, in case I saw that big buck at 400 yards. I think it was 30 yards. <laughs> he shot that That's thing. nice. That's nice. Oh, That's it's a great fun. story. So, um, yeah, get yourself ready. We're going to head out there for the, for the season. We're going to probably do some quail hunting too. Right. Tommy said the pheasant population is looking pretty grim, but quail could be pretty nice. He's hearing some pretty good reports and seeing some coveys. So we'll take Echo along okay. and we'll do some quail hunting. I think I'm going to leave Covey home to guard the, the fort. Um, and then we'll have Betsy here with two mean dogs. There you go. <laughs> and well, I thought you were going with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> one mean dog will be with you. The other two mean dogs will be home. Okay. And um, what else are we going to do? Ooh. I wanted to get you into squirrel hunting. You said you've never hunted Never done squirrels? that, Ron, I think. Uh, I mean, obviously, I've read about it and known about it my whole life, mm -hmm. but I've never done it. Never so. done it. Now, Steve is a cook. Unlike me, who's a heat it and eat it kind of a guy, this gentleman knows how to make some yummy stuff. So I told him, we'll shoot the squirrels. I'll show you how to clean them and stuff. If you cook them up and make us a, I don't know, what, are you going to come up with a recipe? Well, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if not, I'll make one up. Okay. Well, we're going to have some fine eating. So maybe we'll do a video on this. I can't promise any real hot shot hunting video stuff, but it'll be one of my old buddies going honey kind of shows, which might be kind of nice. We'll see what we come up yeah. with, but stay tuned. We might get a big white tail for Steve. We might get him into some quail, into some squirrels, maybe get Echo into her first quail, and we're going to have ourselves a good old time. Yeah, and I want to impress on you guys something I probably don't need to, especially if you're a little older and further down the road than the young guys. When you really start to appreciate more of that camaraderie stuff in the hunt that we always talk about. When I was younger, it was all about the deer, the hunt, get the limit and all this right. kind of stuff, big antlers and everything else. Yeah, I still enjoy being successful and I still enjoy looking for a bigger deer or something. But as long as I am out there enjoying myself, nice weather, bad weather, whatever it is, but being out in nature and, and realizing at my age how rare this is for most of the world, for people to do the kinds of things that we can do Yep. To be that intimate with nature and have the ability to hunt the way humans have since day one and utilize that natural resource. It's infinitely biodegradable and renewable and all organic. And it is just, it's what humans were made to do. So we're going to be out having a good time. And then when you throw into that, the renewed appreciation of friendship, um, it just all comes together into a kind of a special opportunity for which 
I'm actually, Steve, more excited about our little trip here to Kansas than I was about going to Mozambique a couple of years ago. Any of these big adventure hunts mm -hmm. that I go on because it's it's so much more special when it's with good friends. You know, that's true. I think I was we had talked about some of this earlier. And um, one of the things that was a stark reality to me was the recognition of, in myself about how much hunting I've done by myself. Mm -hmm. And I would say in excess of 80% of the hunting that I've done in my lifetime, I was by myself. Mm -hmm whether it was ducks or upland birds or mostly mule deer and elk and that antelope and that kind of stuff. Because nobody else, they either didn't have the time, they didn't have the resources or they weren't interested or whatever it was. And, and uh, so self-taught, you know, go out and learn the hard way, do, do all that kind of stuff. And um, all of a sudden though, I think the turning point for me was when I started having the opportunity to hunt with my son. All of a sudden, I realized that that was the that that you know that constant striving to go do it, to go fill your limit, you know, collect it, whatever, you know, set the meat aside, but just just the whole idea of of going and doing it. When I started doing it with my son, all of a sudden, I realized how insignificant that was in relationship to the time together. Mm -hmm. And he's grown, has his own family. We don't get to. We don't get to hunt much anymore together. And so I miss that. And this is an opportunity to have something like that, you know, to go somebody you trust, somebody that you respect and somebody that you have fun with and just go do it. Yeah. You just go do it. Just go live the, live the adventure, you yeah. know, just find, figure it out and go do it. Even though I've never done it before quite like this, mm -hmm. that's the exciting part of it is figuring it out. Just go do yeah. it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and it'll be fun for me because you're going to see country that I've known for several years through my eyes, or I get to see it through your eyes, the, mm -hmm. you know, the first timer, because I can remember the first times that I discovered Kansas and the big rolly grassland hills. We're going to be in the tall grass prairie, and if they've had any kind of moisture, that grass will grow taller than you, and you're going to see old structures made out of the chalk stone, the 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 original pioneers made their fence posts out of the ground. They would dig down to the base layer of chalk rock that used to be an ancient seabed. So it's all chalk. And you're, there are snails in there, all this petrified stuff. And you'll find old dugout areas where they used to get this stone. They would literally go out there and cut the stone into a rectangular post, hundreds of pounds, load them into a wagon, drag them out and make their fence lines with can you imagine there's no, no the trees, workload? Right? Huh? No trees. No, no trees. This is out in the tall grass prairie. We're going to see that old dugouts where they would hide from the the tornadoes coming through. <laughs> Wizard of Oz stuff, oh, man. Yeah, yeah. It, it's cool. There are even some caves out there. People think Kansas, boring. There are some underground stuff and some alcoves along the river. Really? And some caves. I've even gone back into bat caves a good hundred yards, and it kept going. I don't want to go any further with my primitive little flashlight when I'm out deer hunting, but right. there's some amazing country there. Oh, I can't wait a, to see that. I just, blast. You know, there's, there's something to be appreciated <clears throat> no matter where you go. You know, you, you just have to stop and you have to recognize what you're seeing as a marvel in yeah. and of itself mm -hmm. and appreciate it for what it is. Yeah. Even the simple stuff, right? Yeah. The very, very, very simple stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, that's enough rambling from a couple of old guys here, but we actually have got to get outside and uh, see some simple stuff like more pheasants flushing. <laughs> there you go. I'm up for so, that. Hey, we want to thank you all for joining us. I hope we've uh, given you a little bit of inspiration, if not all that much useful information. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> two old guys talking. Yeah, yeah. Two old guys talking, but Hey, yeah, they might have picked up a thing or two. Hey, let us know if you enjoy these kinds of rambling uh, interviews every once in a while, because I sure enjoy doing them. But if you guys think it's a waste of time, I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe we're going to get that 300 H&H &H in here when it's actually working, and we'll shoot it and see what we've got. I'm, I'm hoping. Uh, I really am hoping. I'm banking on it. All right. So. so until next time, everyone, and you included, Steve, and even Grandpa Ron here, let's all hunt honest and shoot straight. We'll see you next time.